live from Austin, Texas, it's theCUBE, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2017. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Linux Foundation, and theCUBE's ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE live in Austin, Texas for our exclusive coverage of the Cloud Native Conference and KubeCon with Kubernetes, not being used with Cube, the Cube which we're live, eight years running. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE Media with my co-host Stu Miniman, and I'm excited to have CUBE alumni and his distinguished industry legend, Lou Tucker, uh, Vice President and CTO of Cloud Computing at Cisco Systems. Welcome back to theCUBE, great to see hey, you. Great to be back, it's one of my favorite shows. Lou, we've had many conversations over the years and it's always great to have you on because you got, you're on the cutting edge perspective, but you have a historical view as well. You've seen many waves of innovation. And you know, obviously you have, you have intellectual property in the Computer History Museum. Yeah. I mean, your resume goes on and on. But you gotta, gotta admire this community. Three years old, it was you, me, and JJ was sitting around at OpenStack in Vancouver three year and a half years ago, having a beer after the, after the event uh, one of these days. And we're talking about Kubernetes. And we were really right. riffing on orchestration and kind of shooting the arrow forward, kind of reading the tea leaves and we were predicting Interclouding, like internetworking, exactly. Cisco core competency, the notion of application developers wanting infrastructure as code. Um, we didn't actually say microservices, but we were kind of describing a world that would be microservices and this awesomeness that's going on with the cloud. What a. You were right, you were right. We were right, <laughs> no, it wasn't me, it was the community. This is how communities right. operate. It is, it is. I think that what we're seeing, and particularly in, in these open source communities, you're getting the best ideas and therefore a lot of people are looking at this future space and then we bring together the community, get the projects that we work together on it yeah. and that's how we move it forward. You've been a great leader in the community, just want to give you some props for that, you deserve it. Um, but more importantly is just the momentum going on right now and I want to get your take. You know, you, you're, you're, you're squinting through the growth, you're looking at the innovation, looking at the big picture certainly from a Cisco perspective but also as an industry participant. Where's the action? I mean obviously containers, grew, that tide came in, a lot of boats floated up, we saw microservices, yep. boom, then yep. we now, Kubernetes getting better and better, multiple versions, it's, some say commoditized, some would say more interoperable. Really, that's a, the connection tissue for multi-cloud. Exactly right. Where's yeah. the, yeah. Do you see the same thing, where's the action? So, cloud computing is going everywhere now, and so it's natural that we see sort of one of the next phases of this is in the area of multi-cloud, that customers, they are in public cloud, they have private data centers where they want to run similar applications. They don't want to have completely different environments. What they really want to see is a consistent environment across which they can deploy applications. And that consistent environment also has to have security, security policies and authentication services and a lot of these things. And to really drive the innovation, what I find interesting is that the services that are coming now out of public cloud, whether it be in AI or serverless, um, event-driven kind of programming models, enterprises want to connect into that. And so one of the things I think that that leads to is that you're beginning to hear it talk now, just beginning to hear it, which is this project called Istio, which is a service mesh, because what that really allows... Oh, what's the project name? It's called Istio, I-S-T-I-O, I okay. .io. Um, everything is open source. It's a project that is contributed to by Google, and IBM, and Lyft, and now Cisco is getting involved in it as well. And what it really plays into is this world of multi-cloud. That now we can actually access services in the public cloud from your own private data center, or from the public running applications in a public cloud, you can access services that are back in your data center. Yeah. So it's really about this kind of application level networking uh, stack that means that application developers can now offload all of that heavy work to a service mesh, and therefore that will accelerate applications. So it's interesting, I heard uh, some talk about things like Envoy, Edge, and service proxies, yep. and service proxies have been a nice tool to kind of cobble together kind of old legacy stuff, but now you're seeing stuff go to the next level. Um, stat I heard in the keynote, I want to get your reaction mm -hmm. to this, because this kind of jumps out yep. at me. Lyft, was, Lyft had created a mesh over hundreds of thousands of services, over millions of transactions per second. Lyft, mm -hmm. Uber's got some stuff mm -hmm. on the monitoring side, Google's donating. Mm -hmm. This is high scale, large scale cloud guys who had to build their own stuff with open source, right. now contributing all this stuff back. This is the mesh you're talking about, correct? This, this is exactly right, yeah. Because what we're seeing is, um, we've talked about microservices, and Kubernetes is about orchestration of containers. 
And that had accelerated application development and deploying it. But now the services, each one of those services still has all of this networking stuff they have to deal with. They have to deal with load balancing, they have to deal with retries, uh, they have to deal with authentication. So instead what is happening now, we're recognizing these common patterns. This is what the community does over there. You see a common pattern, you abstract it, and you push that out into what is known sidecars now, so that the application developer doesn't have to, the application doesn't get changed when you need to change, like bring up a couple more services over here. Put this on a different cloud. The, the individual components now aren't unaffected by that because all of that work has been offloaded into a service mesh. Yeah, Luke, could you bring us inside a little bit yeah. when you dig into that next level of kind of networking, because sure. you used to be kind of network administrator, running around the data center, everything from pulling cables to you know, zoning and everything like yep. that. Now, you know, it's multi-cloud, multi-service, everything's faster, you know. The role of the architect, the, the, the person running it, you know, automation, you know, help, help you know, we don't have an hour, but you right, know, give right, us a little right. bit about you sure. know, what it means so, to be a networking person these yes. days. Well, it's interesting because one of the things that we know application developers did not want to become is to become a network engineer. <laughs> and yet to do a lot of what they had to do, they had to, to learn a lot of those skills. And instead they would rather set things up by policy. For example, they would like to be able to say, if I'm deploying now the version two of my application, it's a classic thing we talk about in Istio, the next version we want to just direct 5% of the traffic to it. Make sure it's okay before we turn over the whole thing. You should be able to do that at the application level and through a service mesh that is built in networking at the application level, the application guys can do it. Now the role of the network engineer is still the same. They have to provide the basic infrastructure to allow that to happen. And for example, a lot of the infrastructure now is extending the cloud from public cloud through the cloud VPN services that they have back into the data center. So Cisco, for example, is putting technologies that are running at uh, AWS and at Google and Azure that allows that to come back into the data center. So we can run Cisco virtual routers in the cloud connected back up into data center. So their standard networking policy that the network engineers really want to see enforced, they can be assured that that's enforced and, that's and decoupled. then Istio layers on top of it. And that's decoupled from the application. This is right, right. what we've been talking about since 2010, our eighth year of the cube, infrastructure as code. This is what DevOps was all about and now is evolving mainstream. Absolutely right. You really want infrastructure to be as boring as possible, mm -hmm. as, as, as capable and as secure, and now give a lot more um, control over to the application developer. And, and we also know that, it, I mean, it's, right now it's really based largely on Kubernetes, that's a great example, but that will connect into virtual machines, it will connect into legacy services. So all of this has to do with connecting all of those pieces that are today in an enterprise moving to a public cloud, and that transition doesn't happen wholesale. Yeah. You move okay. a couple yeah. over. Luke, uh, one thing, I want you to look back, you know, we, John talked about, you know, we interviewed a bunch of years at OpenStack. Yeah. What, what's your take on the role of OpenStack today? Is there still a role in OpenStack? Yeah. And how's that kind of compare contrast yeah, to what actually, we're doing yeah. here? Yeah, I'm happy to answer, because I'm, I actually am I'm on both boards. I'm on the CNCF board, and I'm on the OpenStack board, yeah. and I have contributors in my teams to both uh, efforts across the board. And I think that the role that we're seeing of OpenStack is OpenStack is evolving also, and it's becoming more embraceive and it's becoming about open infrastructure. And it's really about how do you create these open infrastructure plays. So it is about virtual machines and containers and bare metal and setting up of those services. So Kubernetes works just great on top of OpenStack, and so now people get to have a choice because one of the hard things I think for mostly enterprise developers and everything else is that the pace of change is so fast. So how do they try out some of the newer technologies that still can be connected back into the existing legacy systems? And that's why I think that we're seeing the role for OpenStack is to make that you can put with virtual machines, you can stand them up in there, and you can have the same virtual machines essentially running in, in the so cloud. So virtual machines versus um, you know, other approaches has come up as a trade-off we heard in the keynote yep. between yep. cost, I mean speed, and security. Yeah, security is super important. So let me get your thoughts on how that plays out because you know we've got the pluggable architectures, another big theme that we heard in the keynote, yep. which is essentially just meaning like, you know, have a very focused, leverageable piece of code that right. can be connected into Kubernetes. But with VMs now, some are saying VMs are slow when you try to do security, but you want slow, yeah. boring when you need it, but you want speed and secure when you need it too. How do you get that both yeah. out of that? Yeah, well without being too geeky in terms of, you know, a virtual machine is emulating an entire computer. 
And so it, makes, it looks like a computer, so you're running your traditional applications on top of a virtual machine. Because same as they would if they were running on what we call bare metal machine. So therefore, that is by necessity much heavier. You bring around a whole operating system and things like that. Containers, they role, And there's a role for that too. There's absolutely yeah. a role for okay. that. Now containers? Yeah. But, but containers then are really much more about, it's an application packaging exercise so that you can say, I'm going to run this application, I just want all its dependency packaged up. I'll assume there's an operating system there. I'm going to, to count on the fact that there's a single operating system so you can spin up containers, they're much more lightweight, much more quickly. And now there's even things such as Kata containers that are coming out of Intel, which is now merging those the technologies. Clear containers. clear containers, they came originally clear containers, and now it's merging because we're saying we want the security and the protection that you get with a virtual machine tied into like the VTX instruction set in the hardware. So you can get that level of security assurances, but now you get the speed of containers. So I think we're continuing to see you know, the whole community evolving in this direction of making things easier for application developers, faster to, to do it. They're increasing in scale, so management and orchestration, we've talk, we talked about that three years ago, <laughs> that that would be a big issue, and guess what? Of course it is, that's exactly what Kubernetes And the, the role of the data is going to be critical, okay, and, and this is where a lot of people in the enterprise that we talk to love the story, they love the narrative, but they're hearing things that they've never heard before and they kind of slow down. So I'd like you to take a minute, Lou, and explain mm -hmm. to the person watching, CIO, chief architect, network guy, whatever, what, what the hell is this Kubernetes hubbub about? What is Kubernetes? From sure. your perspective, how would you wrap that up and, and describe the, what it is and the impact to the customer? Yep, so formally it, it, it's an orchestration of, of a container. So what that means is that when you're developing an application, if you want it to be resilient, you want several, several instances of that application running. And you want traffic then to be load balanced across it. Kubernetes provides that level of orchestration to make sure there's only three running. If one fails, it can bring up another one. And it can do that completely automated. So it's a, it's a layer that really manages the deployment of containers. You, as an application developer, you still write your application, you package it up into a container, be a Docker container, and then you deploy it using Kubernetes in there. What was interesting, and I think that this is what we recognized in this last year, I think, is that Kubernetes has a very simple networking model, which is basically that of having a, a way to load balance across multiple containers and keep them running. If you have anything more complicated about different services that you want to talk to from those containers, that may be different places in the, in the, in the universe, <laughs> um, we don't have a mechanism for doing that. And everybody was having to write their own. So again, that's where the idea of a service mesh, Istio. That's where the meshing comes in. That's where the meshing. Hundreds and hundreds Linker of services. Linkerd has been doing it for a while. Envoy. And Lyft and Uber, they had to do it because they had massive explosion of devices. Right, right, exactly right. And so that's why getting together the, the code from Lyft and Envoy, adding a control plane to it, which is what Istio really is about, brings that out too. So now it sounds like an operating system to me, but I'll have one more question for you. You mentioned, in you, as you described Kubernetes. Isn't that auto-scaling? If I'm familiar with AWS, isn't that just auto-scaling, or is it auto-scaling for application instances? Or is auto-scaling more it, defined it, differently? It, it, it does do the auto, it does do the scaling parts, it does the resiliency part, but that's it has a very simple model for that. And that's why you need to have others, that, but it's the beginning of that orchestration because layer. Because it's got the container level, has all those right. inherent properties. And it, can, and it can make sure to keep those containers alive and well and manage the life cycle. And that's the difference. And that's the real difference. Where the auto scaling from Amazon as a service is purely a networking uh, capability then tied into bringing so up new So this is like auto scaling on steroids. So it is, it is. But one of the differences also is that um, Kubernetes and what we're doing here is all open source. So you can run it anywhere. You don't get, I mean a lot of people are very concerned about being locked into, it used to be you're locked into Oracle or to Microsoft or whatever you're, or Java on premise or things like that. What a proprietary operating system. You know, and now they have concern being locked into these services that are in the public cloud providers. And what we're seeing now with Kubernetes and we're seeing in almost everything around here, by open sourcing that, the advantage is now the enterprise can run the same technology inside without being locked into a vendor and then the, as they do in the public cloud. Yeah, so we spent a bunch of time talking about kind of multi-cloud 
Uh, some of the more interesting pieces is what's happening at the edge in IoT. We've heard Cisco talking about it for many years, networking, of, of course, important. What, what, what's your take? What are you working on uh, with, yeah, with regards a couple, to that these there's days? There's a couple yeah. new, new trends that we've been, IoT is actually now um, really getting realized, I think, because it is, being, it is pushing a lot of the computing out to the edge, whether it be in cell phone towers, or base stations, um, uh, retail stores, uh, those, that kind of edge. At the same time, um, we're, we're seeing this multi-cloud that we want the service, we want the big services. If I want to use a machine learning service, I want to use it up in the cloud and I need to now connect it back to those devices. So multi-cloud is really about addressing how do you develop applications that run across multiple, in the cloud, on the edge, in an IOT device. There's also, I think you've probably been hearing serverless and you know, function as a service. These are again, a lighter weight way to have kind of an event driven model. So that if you have an IOT device and it just causes an event, you want to be able to spawn essentially a service in the cloud that only runs to process that one event and then it goes away. So you're not paying to run instances of virtual machines, or whatever, sitting there waiting for some event. You get a trigger and you only pay so it has this micro-billing capability as a part of it so that you just can use only the resources that we finally realized the promise that we always had in cloud computing, which is that pay for only what you need, for what you use. And so this is another way to do that. Lewis, great to have you on theCUBE again. Good to see you, great to the update. I'd like to ask you one more final question to and the segment here, you always have your ear to the ground, reading the tea leaves, um, you have a unique skill to understand the tech at a, the root level. What's coming next? I mean, if we you know, go back and we have these nice conversations where we're riffing on what's kind of coming out in the next two, three years, I mean, it's some clear to some of the visionaries out there, so I've got to ask you, what's going to be hot? What do you see emerging? I mean, as we saw Kubernetes and discussed, we couldn't have predicted this, I mean, I couldn't have. I knew it was going to be hot, I knew it was going to be big, but not this big, mm -hmm. changing the industry. What do you see out there? I mean, what would be the conversation you say, you know, we're going to watch this. This is going to be a value creation opportunity, enabling technology, it's going to make a lot of things flow nicely. What kind of tech well, should... It, it, yeah. Well, it may be a, a, a tried answer, because I think a lot of people are, are seeing the same thing, is that we're actually laying the groundwork here when we talk about multi-cloud, things that are distributed across multiple things, accessing different services. I'm still a big believer in it's going to be in the strength of those services, whether they be you know, speech translation services, whether they mean recommendation engines, whether it means big data services. Access to those services is what's going to be important. And you know, three or four years from now, we're going to be talking about With, the Without a lot of heavy lifting to integrate. Yes, that's exactly the point. We want it so that somebody can, can almost visually wire up these things and take advantage of tremendously powerful machine learning algorithms. Yeah that they don't want to have to hire the machine learning experts to do it, they want to use that as a service. Yeah. Slinging APIs, slinging services, wiring things up. Sounds like it's an operating system to me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's always an operating system <laughs> at the end of the day. Lou Tucker, Vice President, CTO at System Systems, industry legend, on the board of CNCF, the fastest growing organization, where projects equal products equals profit, and of course, the OpenStack. Lou, thanks for coming on theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with Stu Miniman. Back here live in Austin for more live coverage of Cloud NativeCon and KubeCon after this short break. Thank you.